Excellent. Thank you for uh, coming, especially so late in the day. Um. <laughs> All right, my cryptic title, You Can Lead a Designer to Water. Uh, well, let me first start with my name. My name's Gareth Qualley, and I'm a motion graphic designer. Um, and uh, why am I here? Well, basically, uh, I'm going to talk about moving the studio from a proprietary to an open source platform. It was a, an attempt that I did a few years ago. And um, everything that went on about it. But before we do that, let me just talk a bit about myself. Who am I? Um, some of you in the audience might recognize that. I got my start on with motion graphics <laughs> with the Commodore Amiga way back in the 90s. Um, one of the best computers ever made. <laughs> I used Deluxe Paint Imagine. Anyway, um, here's a, a picture of something that I did uh, way back then with a friend of mine, Mark September. You can actually see the pixels. I think it was 300 pixels high, which was high res back then. <laughs> anyway, since then, I've uh, here's some examples of some of the stuff I've done. Um, I've worked in a variety of industries, broadcast, uh, promos, um, commercials, uh, done, uh, I, I call them VR sets, so it's not VR in the traditional sense, it's VR like as in you make a set and then it's all linked up via cameras. Um, technical animations, all sorts of stuff that I've done over the years. Uh, I first started playing with Blender, I think slightly before it was uh, open sourced. It's version uh, 1.5 of the manual. But throughout the years, I, I played with it a bit and then left it. Played with it a bit and left it. And I only really started to use this um, package in 2008. This was one of the first uh, uh, commercials that I used this package for. I'll play it now. I must have clicked play. And I might... Why aren't you playing? Space. Ah! <laughs> it was working. Anyway, it's a very nice metaball animation. I'll show it to you guys if I have time at the end. So back to the talk. Um, I work for a company called ETV in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Um, is their new building against the Table Mountain. Uh, and we were a studio that had uh, initially one channel and then expanded to seven channels. Um, it's free to air, so it was uh, not only terrestrial but also satellite based. Um, there was a motion graphics team of 10 people, um, which I, I ran, and there's a, another member of the team there, Wesley Matia, who, who's now living in, in Holland. Um, here's a, now let's hope this one plays. How do I? Bloody hell. Is it, when I press play, does it? You know what? I'm just going to so you guys get an idea. Have I got multiple versions of this? Let me just close that. Close that. Did I just kill the whole thing? Yeah. There we go. Here. Yeah. Um, I just want to show you some of the work that we did, which I think is probably important to... Uh, oh, yeah. uh, here's the... the metable animation. Trust me. Catch Arnold Schwarzenegger as the ultimate killing machine. The Terminator double feature, Sundays at 8 on E. Uh, so that was... <laughs> nice. uh, that's my clips. Uh, Kid Promo, ATV. ETV. 
anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one. Let me get back to the presentation, or else we're going to run out of time. And okay. So why make the move? So one of the big things that we wanted to do is um, get some of the features that are in Blender that we didn't have in Cinema 4D in our tool chain. So things like cloth, um, smoke, water, those are usually plugins that you have to buy for, for Cinema 4D. Um, our industry was changing. So we had a print team, a motion graphics team, a production team. And we started to do more and more more of each other's jobs as the industry changed. So suddenly we were working on digital billboards, and that's usually part of the print team. But now it's coming to us, and we're working on motion graphics for digital billboards. So we wanted to make sure that as the industry changed, the teams that were involved would be able to start using the tools. And then the investment involved in, in doing that wouldn't be exorbitant, as it would be with a, a proprietary piece of software. So it was a cost-saving initiative. So the process. The first thing I did was talk to the team, see if it, they thought it was a good idea. I didn't want to do it without everyone thinking, what is he doing? He's smoking some crack. So we, um, uh, I spoke to them. Everyone thought it was a, a good idea. I think one of the big things was they could see the investment in themselves because they could then use this at home, either for freelance jobs or for when they moved on to possibly their own company. It wouldn't be necessarily them having to invest in another piece of proprietary software for them to work at home. After I spoke to them, I uh, spoke to my line manager. She thought it was a good idea. I then had to write this big sort of document with numbers and everything to senior management. Uh, it wasn't a quick uh, throw it in and use it. Um, they wanted to know why. Um, there was a, a cost implication. Uh, so uh, we had basically a, uh, a fifth of what we were spending would be spent on Blend as opposed to Cinema 4D, which obviously management likes. They did have a slight issue. Uh, management, the finance and the IT guys were a bit worried about support. Um, I had to do a little bit of education around open, the open source world and how support tends to come from the community, and it's, uh, and it's a symbiotic relationship, whereas with the... Um, a commercial piece of software, there's an in, your relationship comes from the money that you give them. It doesn't necessarily come back to you, um, even though people like to think it does, um, but so be it. Anyway, they all said, yay, let's do it. Um, so around, this was around 2015. Um, we, we started to use Blender. Uh, mainly, we started to use it in um, projects that didn't require any part to touch any other part of the, the tool chain that we were using. So uh, people could use it for individual promos or individual parts that wasn't going to have to link into big brand channel imaging or anything like that. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, we used it in um, a promo here, and we did some tracking in, uh, in Blender. This was done by Wesley, who's sitting over there. And there's the result uh, of, the, of the tracking. We also used it. Uh, uh, for a cloth simulation, we did a, ch a new channel reveal. And uh, uh, again, this was done with by Wesley himself. Unfortunately, all these videos are not playing. This is very frustrating. All right. OK, so the area where it was a little bit more sticky was around uh, the imaging of the channel. So we had an, uh, an existing look that was defined. Uh, by the brand and senior management, and we had executed this successfully in Cinema 4D. So we didn't. We had to ensure that Blender, whatever we did inside Blender, would gel with what was already in Cinema 4D. 
didn't mean that you had to have the exact same reflection with the exact same sort of thing, but it had to be close. It didn't help that everything that we had as a channel, bar one channel, was glass. So everything that we did was expensive in terms of time. So I did uh, uh, some tests. Um, I took the logo fr uh, from Cinema 40 into um, Blender and started to play with cycles and its, uh, uh, and its material system. Got a really nice look out of it, I must be honest. Um, when we showed it to brand and the creative director and everyone, they liked it. Tend to have a bit of a more real feel to it than um, what we were getting out of Cinema 4D. Um, here's another example. We've got uh, the uh, Cinema 4D interface, and this was a, a whole series of pluses, glass pluses, and each channel would then we would just basically have these pluses moving around, and with the glass and the reflection, it creates a really nice, interesting look. So that's the Cinema 4D render. Um, looks good, nothing wrong with it. And this was the Blender render. Now both of these haven't been touched up massively, just a little bit of levels. Uh, um, if I just go back again, you can see there's the Cinema 4D. So the reflections and the refractions are quite different, but everyone actually preferred the Blender when I gave them a blind test. There's something more real about the Cycles render. So. Um, we were about to start refreshing this channel, eMovies Plus. Um, and I was going to drop everyone into the deep end and force ourselves to use Blender for this one, rather than rely on Cinema 4D. Um, but then I got a really nice job offer to go work for the Discovery Channel in the UK. And so this didn't happen. <laughs> and then what happened is Wesley left and he moved to Amsterdam. So basically, this is where the story of Blender being used in ETV ends, because when I spoke to my replacement, Jamie, I uh, asked them whether they were using uh, Cinema 4D or Blender, and they're using Cinema 4D again. So it was a, a, a very interesting experiment, and so I've got some lessons that I've learned that I thought would be useful for you guys. So what was the first lesson I learned is um, you need to have more than one champion to the cause. Um, in, that ca in this case, it was me. Um, Wesley was a close second. He really liked the idea of uh, Blender. He, he's a 2D animator by trade. And when Grease Pencil got added, he was like, oh, this is looking good. So when I left and then Wesley left, no one in my team was using it anymore. Um, my line manager left six months or three months after me. And the head of channels had left six months before me. So after that, there was no one in the company that knew about the project at all. And when times are tight and everything, people go back to what they know. So that, that was a big lesson I learned. Next thing is time. There's never enough time. Um, I'm sure all of you know when you work in commercial production, uh, it's one job after another, and trying to learn new things while working on a job is very difficult and often when things are very tight, as it often is, people will go to the tools that they know rather than the tools that they want to learn. So you need to, you need to make time. And one of the, the ways I thought of doing this was to actually have a conversion team. So you had part of the, the studio working on day to day and the other part, maybe a much smaller part, working on just converting the workflows across to Blender. And you could do this in a number of ways. One of the ones was uh, get the unit system sorted and the templates that you're going to use so that they exist in both packages so that when a, a new project starts and you need the logo, it's there. Same with the assets. Uh, you saw I brought the e-logo across, but there's many more assets, in, 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 especially with the, um, when you've got seven channels to, to look after. So all of those assets have to come across. All the materials have to be aligned Old projects. Old projects are things that uh, we would often, you know, you have your inboard straps and your um, now, next, laters, and all those things that need you go back to often. Those will need to be converted and to be able to be used in either package. And lastly, file formats. Uh, to, to decide on a set of formats that both packages can use and, um, and stick to them. And lastly, document everything. 
and too many companies I've worked at, nothing is documented. And that relates back to um, having a champion to the cause. Often, when those people leave, you end up with these black boxes that no one knows how to use. All right, training wasn't a problem. Um, that was actually quite easy. So people weren't familiar with Blender, but we subscribed to Blender Cloud, and with all the awesome tutorials that you get on the web, um, people got up and running with the interface and how to use it, and people were often quite pleasantly surprised at how it worked. We started to have a, a, these sort of sessions, hour-long sessions called Playtime, where you could just down your tools on your existing job and just play around, uh, build a coffee mug, look at this feature, anything. It didn't really matter. Like a child, you just have playtime, but it's actually educational, educational time. Uh, we also had weekly challenges. Um, so either, well, either weekly or hourly ch challenges, same thing, down tools. Uh, for half a day, you'd say, right, take a logo, animate it, or model a character, or anything. It was just to get familiar with the, the software and, and the interfaces. Other things which we didn't get to do, and this is a, a really nice one, is recreate old work. So now you don't have to think about design. You know what you need to execute because you've done it before. You just have to do it in a different program. So it's very quick for you to now think about um, just the specifics of Blender and not necessarily anything else. Uh, the plan was to create bespoke training, uh, not, not just for the studio. We clearly have stuff that you would have to do that's related to ETV, but also just for the, the wider process, and the aim was then to release that into the community. And, of course, the old deep end. That's always the best way to learn, I find, through experience. Throw yourself into a real project and you force yourself to learn because you've got a deadline. So you often can then work at home, especially with Blender, because you don't have to pay for it. One area that I thought would be nice for us to take something from Cinema 4D is its, uh, uh, its manual. It's got a context-sensitive manual. So if you look here, you can see there's the interface of uh, Cinema 4D. You could hover your mouse over any object or menu item or feature or tooltip or anywhere, and you press Control F1 or Apple F1, and a manual would pop up with the exact thing that you need to know about. This was hugely useful for people that were wanting to get up and running quickly. So you could learn about something that you need to know now and um, get to know it. Areas that we battled with, the material system. The Cycles render engine is a, it's a, a newfangled way of um, lighting and rendering scenes. Cinema 4D is still using its, its old system, great flexible system, but it is, it's using an old methodology. So I know I battled with it and some of the team did because you're going from that type of very typical and even Blender internal uses a very similar system to something like that. So that was for concrete, painted concrete. And it's very different, and so it takes a bit of time to learn this stuff. The other area that we needed some uh, work done or, or focus was on network rendering. At the time, network rendering is not as easy as in Cinema 4D. So Cinema 4D, if you look up close, you have a queuing system that you could do on your machine, or you could use a client-server approach. But both of them used this thing called Team Render. So you would just have uh, an ID and a password, which you would then, the software would connect all the machines together automatically. And whether you're using a client server or a queuing system, you could just render. So it was very artist friendly, uh, something that we'd like to see in Blender. Spline tools as well are a very important part of a motion graphic designer's job. Um, being able to manipulate splines very easily, and this includes text, which I think was touched on in, the, in an earlier talk. Text is very important, and, and uh, Blender has some spline tools and it's text tools, but it would be lovely to see these being developed a little bit further. And dare I say, a NURBS implementation would be, would be wonderful. From a user interface point of view, I know some people have there's always talk about the user interface of Blender. But if you look between Blender and Cinema 4D, they're actually quite similar. You've got a big 
uh, 3D viewport. In the top right here, you've got your object tree in Cinema 4D, and you've got the similar thing in, in Blender. Same with the property. So that I didn't, I didn't actually have a, an issue with. This was uh, rendering was a big learning curve for us. Um, cinema, uh, the ETV at that time, we had Mac Pros, which were great render, uh, render machines, but not when it comes to graphics. Their graphics cards are terrible. Um, great for CPU rendering. And then when I started using Cycles, which just loves GPUs, it would take forever. So some of those renders I, I made up there, I would have to leave it over the weekend and stuff like that. Um, this laptop, which I got just recently, it um, showed me the power of a GPU. Um, so those renders that I had when I rendered them again were extremely quick. So were I at ETV, we would be doing stuff to reconfigure everything to a GPU-based system. So motion graphics designers largely live in an Adobe world and in an After Effects world. Um, After Effects is uniquely um, placed to be almost like a, an advanced video editor. And um, there isn't an open source equivalent like this, or uh, well, none that I've found so far. So it, the, my big thing would be to get um, Blender to play nicely with After Effects. Maxon and Adobe were very clever in that they started to work together. So they've built this very tight integration of the two packages. So in Cinema 4D, when you render, you can say you want an After Effects file, and if you're rendering render passes, it pa puts everything together, packages it, and creates pre-comps, and then you open up an After Effects file with everything ready for you. And then similarly, the other way, if you're designing in After Effects, you can then export your scene to Cinema 4D to do start some things like 3D type and stuff like that. You could even create a Cinema 4D file from inside um, after Effects. And lastly, my, my big thing which I had to learn was to unlearn things. So things like Cycles and um, some of the other new render systems have forced a completely different way of lighting and rendering. And then your material systems change. So I'm a long in the tooth 3D and motion graphics designer who's very used to the old way of working. And it took me, a, you know, I'm in my 40s now, I have to start to learn things are a little bit sticky. So I had to learn to un unlearn. And I, I came up with that uh, phrase, but I, I quickly found out that someone else actually more illustrious came up with that phrase. Alvin Toffler, who's a or was a futurist, and he very eloquently said that. And I think that's sort of the, the take home that I would like to say is that we've got to learn, unlearn, and relearn things. All right, that's my talk. Thank you very much.